Now, we are delighted to have members of the Capitol Press Corps with us this morning. And so as I call their names, if they'd make their way to the stage, first up, Tom Hauser, Chief Political Reporter for Channel 5 KSTP. Tom started at Five Eyewitness News in September of 1992 after reporting and news anchoring jobs in Austin, Minnesota, Fort Myers, Florida, and Des Moines, Iowa. After covering the law enforcement beat in the Twin Cities for several years, Tom began covering Minnesota politics in 1997. He hosts the Five Eyewitness News at Issue Public Affairs program on Sunday mornings. He's received numerous awards for news reporting, including three Emmy Awards for At Issue and the Best Public Affairs Program. And Tom has completed 24, is that still the number, Tom? 20, 26. 26 marathons. He needs to uh, update his bio. Please welcome Tom Hauser. I was busy stealing coffee from a table over there. <laughs> Thank you for that confession. Next up, Mary LaHammer. Mary has been a program host and political reporter for Twin Cities Public Television since 1998. She won several Emmys and numerous other awards in several states for her anchoring, reporting, producing, and photography. Mary was named one of the best capital reporters in America by the Washington Post, best TV reporter by Minnesota Monthly, and best newscaster by Twin City Pages Magazine. Mary is a native Minnesotan who grew up within just a couple of miles of this room right here and attended the University of Minnesota and has a, holds a degree in journalism and mass communications from the University of Minnesota. Please welcome Mary LaHammer. <laughs> Rachel Stassenberger is a reporter for, in state politics for the Star Tribune. Rachel has made her office in the Minnesota Capitol basement since 2001, first for the Pioneer Press and then for the last five years for the Star Tribune. Reporting on Minnesota's politics and government, she's covered two state government shutdowns, two statewide recounts, two Minnesota presidential campaigns, and governors from three different parties. We are an exciting state, my goodness. <laughs> she's long worked on finding new ways to share information, including blogging, tweeting, videoing, e-newslettering, and since last summer, her job has morphed so she can further explore digital delivery of the news. Rachel grew up in New York City, but has Minnesota roots. Her grandfather is a former Minnesota governor. Welcome, Rachel. <laughs> and finally, we have Bill Salisbury. Bill is the political reporter for the St. Paul Pioneer Press. He's covered politics and government for more than 40 years. He started reporting for his father's weekly newspaper, the Belgrade Minnesota Tribune, while he was still in high school. While attending the University of Minnesota, he wrote for the Minnesota Daily Newspaper, the Ivory Tower Literary Magazine. After graduating from the University of Minnesota Morris with a bachelor's degree in history, he started his daily newspaper career in 1971 at the Fairmont, Minnesota Sentinel. He joined the Rochester Post Bulletin in 72 and became that paper's state capital correspondent in 1975. He joined the St. Paul Pioneer P Press in 1977 and has been assigned to the State Capitol Bureau the following year. He's served as a Pioneer Press Washington correspondent from 1994 through 1999 when he returned to the State Capitol Bureau. Please join me in a warm welcome for Bill Salisbury and all of our panelists. All right, welcome to all of you. We've, we are, uh, we've got a couple of questions that we're going to ask from here, but we're, go we're going to leave plenty of time to get to you guys in the audience and, and have your questions answered as well. So if the first question is, and we're going to start right here to my, uh, to my right with Mary. Take us behind the scenes on the minimum wage debate. It's an important issue for many small businesses we represent, particularly in the hospitality industry. And it was one of the more interesting and contentious debates during the legislature this year. So tell us about the linchpin in reaching that agreement. Was it really the Senate office building? <laughs> we'll see if I bite on the Senate office building one. I'll, I'll start in general because this one seemed like the slam dunk, the easy one. If we go back to the pre-session briefings where lawmakers sit at tables like this and sit before us and we ask them questions, I think we'll all remember them saying, oh yes, minimum wage, yeah, that's top three, easy. And the Speaker of the House set the bar pretty high which is often a little dangerous in politics, I recall him saying, that'll get done within the first couple of weeks of session. It didn't, <laughs> as we know. The, the number they agreed on real quickly, and that wasn't the problem. They got to 950 without too much trouble. But it was devil in the details, as always. Are we having audio problems? No, yeah. I think we're, we're looking for that extra microphone. Okay. Oh, there's one. It's just hiding oh. in front of Bill's oh, name thank tag you. there. I'm sorry to interrupt. So. The indexing to inflation became the issue, and 
folks will deny or insist upon the fact that the legislative office building was part of it, but I'd say in general what I learned from that debate was one party government isn't going to be boring and isn't going to always be easy and the House and the Senate and the governor find plenty to disagree on and the Senate broadly just takes a different approach to things. Senator Bach knows he has time. He has all the time in the world and the House, the House members here will know they need to face you and that makes them a little more fearful and a little more active and Tom Bach can kind of sit back as Senate Majority Leader and take time and kind of put, put the brakes on one party government. We've heard him use that phrase that he's kind of the backstop on things. So he wanted a slower approach, wasn't as sure about indexing to inflation. So I'd say that was some of the dynamics behind slowing it down. Great. Tom. Uh, the minimum wage issue I look at as kind of a, a snowball that was going downhill. There, there was nothing that was going to stop uh, the minimum wage from being raised uh, in Minnesota this year because it's happening across the country. Uh, you probably just saw, I think, the city of Seattle. It, it's almost like a bidding contest now. I think in Seattle it's a million dollars an hour, I think, is the new minimum wage. <laughs> I mean, they just, it, it, it literally has become a bidding war. Who can go the highest? And I don't think you're going to see it at, at the federal level just because, well, frankly, Congress is so dysfunctional. There's no way they'll ever agree to it. But state by state, city by city, uh, you are seeing this happen. And certainly here in Minnesota, it was... It was probably overdue to have it go up. Whether it should have gone up to the level it did is, you know, for someone else to decide. But I know in polling that we have done, uh, the minimum wage has had broad bipartisan support. I, I think in our last poll it was 60-some percent of people thought, yes, the minimum wage uh, should go up. Uh, now, the, the higher it would go up, maybe the less support there was, but certainly uh, this was a fait accompli. It was going to go up uh, this session. The only reason it didn't happen last session was because some politics got in the way, but I was not at all surprised. This one, I thought, was, was a pretty easy one. Okay. Rachel? Oh, no, you got to turn it on. <laughs> oh, the visual professionals always have the best toys. Um... <laughs> so let's talk about the Senate office building. You know, throughout the early part of the session, that was a major issue. It passed in, passed actually in 2013. Um, it was a last minute deal. Very few people expected it. It was something the Senate absolutely wanted and the House, frankly, saw the political downside of it. You know, we heard from the Republican lawmakers that that was one of their top disappointments. Senator Tom Bach, a longtime uh, legislator said it was absolutely necessary, it's been too long, they need to get the sen their own, senators their own office. So they came into the session with a couple of fairly big goals, but not that many. They had to pass a second tax bill, which some of the folks here have already praised because they took mm -hmm. away some of the taxes they put in place last year. Um, the Senate wanted to do the office building. They wanted to pass minimum wage and they wanted to do a supplemental budget and a few other things. So they come in and they have this huge fight over the tax bill. The tax bill, um, you know, there were policy differences, there were philosophical differences, there were timing differences. The House wanted to pass the tax bill immediately. Dayton wanted to pass the tax bill immediately. You'll recall that his first day back at the Capitol after his surgery, he, he took the Senate to task over the tax bill. My understanding is that actually came after a fight over the Senate office building, where the senators said, we, and I see some nods from some of the lawmakers, the senators said, you want your tax bill, we want our building. And so there was that connection. Now, I see another nod back there from Kurt Zellers. <laughs> um, I think he was actually nodding off. <laughs> oh. So the, the, those two bills were absolutely connected early in the session. So then the tax bill passed with huge bipartisan support. Republicans said it should have been bigger tax cuts. Democrats said we've got to fix some of the problems from last year. And at the same time as that was passing, there were deals being cut on the Senate office building. Now the timing on the minimum wage is very interesting. The House approved the Senate office building uh, within a day or two of them announcing this massive fight the surprisingly massive fight over the minimum wage. As Mary said, indexing was a major deal there. And in the few weeks, as Demo there was lots of Democrat and de on Democrat violence, 
House Speaker, House Speaker Paul Thiessen, who had been pushing this 950 plus the indexing, said, if Tom Bach wants to kill minimum wage, he should be straight with Minnesotans and just tell them. Now, those are pretty strong words for your ally and your friend who you've been on the campaign trail with. You're all pushing together. Tom Bach said, if Paul Thiessen needs indexing for his election, well, then he just won't have a minimum wage bill. Again, early in the session, a huge fight. And so my take is that absolutely there were some bad feelings over minimum wage. There were some bad feelings over the Senate office building. There were some bad feelings over the tax bill, which basically everyone agreed on. And so the three are connected in a way, which is that once you start to smooth these things out, suddenly at the legislature you see a lot more progress. But my understanding is it was not give us our building and you'll get your minimum wage. It was a little more connected to that early tax bill fight. And Bill, did you get that other microphone working? Uh, is it working? Yes. Yeah, it's perfect. Working. Great. Uh, I have very little to add to that on the minimum wage. I'd just like to start with a, a caveat about us reporters. Generally, you know, we, we aren't behind the doors. We aren't in the uh, governor's mansion cutting the deal or watching him cut the deal. Generally, we're about as close to what really goes on there as a crab blouse is to the begatting of a child. <laughs> uh, we can glean a little bit, you know. Uh, we're, we're outside, we can get tips and bits and pieces, uh, and there were a lot of connections. Both the governor and uh, the speaker said at one point or another that the Senate office building was always a, a big issue in their private negotiations over the, over the other issues. So there was a connection. They all de deny that it was a direct connection, but they were, they were tied together. Thank you so much. Um, and I do want to point out to Representative Zellers, we will be getting back to you with that question of the day. So. <laughs> Good luck with the sleeping in deal. All right. The governor made several statements during this year's legislative session that ruffled some DFL feathers. He scolded Senator Bach for not bringing up the first tax bill in a timely manner. And then he said the legislators were hiding behind their desks on the medical marijuana debate. Why did he go public with this criticism and on what, when his party controlled the legislature? And then why did the legislators just let him just take it on the chin? And let's start with Bill. Yeah. All right, great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I got a fun one to start with. Yeah. Uh, one, one of the reasons that, that uh, Governor Dayton was criticizing the legislators was that he was taking a lot of heat. Uh, he really botched the medical marijuana story, which was the story of the session. This is my 34th session. I have never seen one like this, where there was a, a real grassroots mo movement. Uh, we did our, our session summary. Uh, the lead on it was, sometimes the best lobbyists in the world are moms and dads. And that's what happened with the medical marijuana bill. Uh, these moms and dads were there with their children, many of whom were having seizures in the Capitol during the hearings. Uh, it was just a very moving uh, story, and it's one that we couldn't resist. Uh, and the governor was saying at the beginning of the session, uh, no way will I support a sign a medical marijuana bill as long as law enforcement is opposed to it. Uh, and after he had made one of those statements uh, several times, he did invite those protesters who, who stood outside the mansion one day in the winter, and uh, he invited them in, as he has wanted to do when people are standing outside, uh, and had a long discussion with them. Uh, and during that discussion, made some comments about, uh, well, you probably don't need to legalize it because it's available. Uh, some of the parents came out of there and said that he was encouraging to buy illegal marijuana on the street. And he started taking a lot of heat for that. Uh, the pressure was heavy on him, and he was taking all the heat. But legislators were saying, well, you know, why bother with the issue? Tom Box said, why bother giving it a hearing if he's, if he's not going to sign the bill? Well, after what, it was a week or two of taking this heat, the governor finally made his comment about legislators hiding behind, or sitting behind their desk and hiding behind their desk. And the legislative leaders, at least Senator Bach, took that as an indication, oh, well, he wants us to give it a hearing, let's do it. Uh, and so that, that was a real turning point on that issue. Uh, and I think the reason he said that was he was just fed up with being the, the one guy who's taking all heat on this issue and the legislators are sitting back and not doing much of anything on it. I think that was the reason for his critical remarks on that part, on that portion. Good. Rachel, your thoughts on that? I actually wouldn't give Dayton that much credit for strategy on medical marijuana. <laughs> um, 
you know, I think it was one of the more difficult issues that the governor has faced because there was this grassroots movement because he made some political missteps and it was a difficult issue for him to contend with. He had that meeting at the, the governor's residence when he was still recovering from his hip surgery. He didn't come in with a, a clear strategy. And so I don't know that it was strategic. What it was, I think, on both of those issues was more Dayton. Dayton has been around in the state in politics for 40 years. And if you look at polls, and I'm told the internal polls, his trust levels are off the charts. People say he does what he thinks. He is, you know, earnest. Now, they may say he's earnest and I hate him, but they still sort of believe in their guts that he is kind of doing what he thinks is best, even if you disagree with him. And so that's really powerful. So if you look at, you know, those two inc instances on the tax bill and on the medical marijuana bill, he came out and does, did what governors do, which is set their own agendas and is able to push the legislature in their direction. And the outcomes of both of those mm -hmm. actually turned out rather well for him. You know, he got his tax bill passed early, not as early as he wanted, but, you know, I think Republicans and Democrats will be on the campaign trail talking about how they cut taxes in an election year. Funny that. You know, and on medical marijuana, he can say, look, I wanted to get really sick children who have these incredible stories. You know, there were tears all over the place at the Capitol this year. You know, really sick adults, a drug that may help them. And so he's able to look compassionate. And as Bill said, his requirement was that law enforcement sign on. Guess what? Law enforcement signed on. In fact, they went a little beyond neutral on it, I'm told, to kind of supporting it. So he was able to make law enforcement happy. He was able to make the sick kids happy. He was able to be compassionate. And yeah, did, did his comments make the senators particularly uh, get a little angry? Yeah. Did he get an outcome that he kind of wanted? Yeah. But not strategic. <laughs> and I agree with Rachel. There was no strategery here at all. He, <laughs> Governor Dayton is very frustrated by the legislative process. Uh, there's a reason he only spent one uh, term in the U.S. Senate, because he was probably spending most of his time bouncing off the walls in his office because he didn't like being one of 100. He could never stand being one of 134 in the Minnesota House or one of 67 in the Senate. Uh, he likes to be the chief executive. He has no patience for the legislative process. And so when he gets frustrated, as he did with the tax bill and as he did with the medical marijuana issue, uh, it doesn't matter to him that the leaders of the House and Senate are also Democrats. He kind of sets the party aside and he says, as Rachel said, what he thinks. This is what he wants and this is what he's going to go after. And I don't think he really gives a lot of thought to the political repercussions of the things he says because I would almost guarantee you that some of these sound bites, uh, like lawmakers hiding behind their desks, will be coming to a television ad near you uh, very soon. Uh, there are a number of other comments like that, and by the way, they're going to be very grainy, uh, <laughs> even though they were shot, many of them, in high definition. They will end up, they will end up looking like television from 1957. Um, and they will look very sinister, and they will be in a number of ads that will be uh, airing very soon in, in house races, in the governor's race. Uh, you're going to see a lot of this. So the, the governor... Uh, and he is very earnest. Uh, th those those uh, polling numbers on him are, are, are probably correct, but that is not uh, really the best thing for you as you're heading into an election, the fact that you say and do things that could come back to bite you or bite your party. And that's what's really going to be fascinating to watch as we move forward because that uh, medical marijuana issue uh, regarding you know, these parents saying, uh, you know, he was advising us to go buy marijuana on the street. Again, that will be in television ads, guaranteed. And these were all issues of his own making that he didn't have to do, but they're going to be out there front and center this fall. And Tom, if they weren't going to be in commercials, they will be now. I think yes. you gave some strategists in the audience some well, ideas. Sure yeah, I, I, I think so too, but just in case. I, I think the context that I want to remember this story on is where the governor was at when the first dust-up happened. He was barricaded in the governor's residence recovering from this hip surgery in a body cast. 
And I couldn't say that word enough on air, I must confess, body cast, body cast, body cast. It was just kind of fun to say and, and surreal to imagine our governor during a legislative session in a body cast. Oh, thank, thank you. It was a... In a body cast, yeah, the governor in a body cast. He admitted to us at one point in a conference yes. call that he couldn't wear pants. Right, <laughs> he did, yeah, yes. That's why he couldn't go to the Capitol. It's true. And should we confess, then one of our colleagues started nicknaming the governor, Governor Sweatpants. <laughs> his, his staff did not like that one bit. Yeah, but he, he told us he wouldn't come back till he could put pants on. Well, apparently... He dress was, pants, dress they pants. clarified. Yes, yes, to clarify. <laughs> He got so upset while holed up in the governor's residence in that partial body cast, we should admit it, it is partial, that he had it removed early. This is how angry and upset he was against the advice of his Mayo Clinic doctors. They tore off that cast early so that he could hobble up to the Capitol and get mad at his DFL Senate. So that's pretty fascinating that that dynamic occurred at the beginning, and that was the tax bill, but again, frustrated with the Senate and they're slower movement because they have more time and they don't need to act as quickly. <clears throat> and the one thing when we talk about strategy that I was skeptical of how much strategy there was as well until Senator Bach, right after that incident with the tax bill, the you know, Senate needs to get going, chastising the Senate, Senator Bach whispered to me later that day, we were texting the whole time, the governor and I. So it made me wonder how much of that was feigned anger from the governor if he was really texting with Tom Bach while they were yelling at each other. Interesting. All right, we're going to start with you, Tom, this time. What were the biggest unreported or underreported stories of 2014, and what stories could you just not get past the producers and the editors? Um, you know, it's, we have like 93 newscasts a day. There, there's no story they wouldn't take from me to help fill that time. But, but I, I think the, un, but, but the difficult story to get across, because there are certain things, and it's different for television and newspapers, if there's a story that isn't uh, very visual, that's hard to get past our producers. Uh, you know, the pay raises for home health care workers and those types of things, not the most visually sexy stories in the world. Sometimes they're important stories, uh, you can still tell them, but uh, you know, maybe not in the same fashion. You're going to tell like the medical marijuana story where you have uh, you know, sick kids having seizures during hearings and news conferences. Uh, but, but an overall theme, a story I, I kind of pushed a few times, but it was, it, it's kind of hard because it's not a, it's not a daily story. But I, I think the interesting thing over the past two years is kind of the, the sea change that, that we've seen in Minnesota where there has been this log jam of a lot of uh, DFL priorities that have finally uh, passed the legislature and been signed into law by a Democratic governor. And, you know, we're talking about a minimum wage, uh, $2 billion in tax increases, even though 500 million of them were, were later uh, taken back. Uh, gay marriage, while not signed into law by the governor, uh, is still a 50-50 proposition in this state if you look at polling yet it is now uh, the law of the land. There have been so many things that, that have passed that uh, largely because there is no check or balance right now. It's a Democratic House, a Democratic Senator, a, a Senate, and a Democratic Governor. And there's, there's nothing standing in their way. The, the Senate office building, uh, you would have never seen that happen with uh, Republicans in control of, of one of the chambers. It was very unusual the way they, they funded it in a tax bill as opposed to through a bonding bill. Uh, they're, you know, essentially paying cash for it instead of bonding for it. With the bonding bill, there's, what is it, a couple hundred million dollars in cash being paid for projects that even the governor said is very unusual. Uh, it's not the way we've done things in the past. And the reason all these things are happening is because they can happen, uh, because Democrats are running the table. They control everything. The interesting thing to see this fall is whether or not Minnesotans are paying attention and whether they think there should be a speed bump along the way. The way the Constitution organized our government was so that things happen slowly. Well, now things are happening very rapidly, and there, there appears to be no end in sight except that there's another election coming up here in about four or five months, 
and all 134 members of the House are up, and so is the governor, and, and we'll see. Maybe this is what Minnesotans want, but uh, we're going to find out here in a couple months. Rachel, your thoughts on that? So I know some of you follow me on Twitter, um, and in my Twitter bio, I disclose a few things about myself. One is that I'm afraid of sinkholes, you know, the, the earth opening up and swallowing houses and cars. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the other part, which is that I say I like geeky political things. So bear with me for a second, because one of the issues, one of the geeky issues I like to cover is campaign finance. Now, everyone grab another cup of coffee. Um, campaign finance, we, we, I write about it a fair amount. I geek out at it, I look at the reports. We can't get the public all that interested in it. Um, and so it often frustrates me that, you know, we write about it and, you know, my editors have actually been very encouraging as I write about it. Um, but the people don't react that much. Um, I've, as I said, I've written a lot about campaign finance and let me tell you the most well-read campaign finance story I did this year was a blog post where we looked at which pizza places federal candidates had been spending money on in Minnesota. Now that's not the geeky side of campaign finance. The geeky side of campaign finance is things like electioneering communications, um, a bill that was before the legislature this year and last year that would essentially say if you spend money on politics, you should disclose what you're spending on and who is giving you money. Now, most people think that already happens, but it doesn't particularly with political nonprofits. Political nonprofits are sort of outside the federal FEC system. They're outside the Minnesota campaign finance system. And there is millions of dollars in Minnesota being spent by them that we don't get to find out about. We see it because we hear from lawmakers and, and voters that the mailings are coming in, but we don't necessarily have all the disclosure. So there were bills to, to require this disclosure this year. You know, as a fan of transparency and, and data, I like to have more information, so it might be a good thing. On the other hand, these bills were not all that well written, according to some proponents and some opponents. Um, they would bring a lot more people into disclosure, could have uh, exposed people to new scrutiny that wasn't quite what the, the lawmakers intended. Um, and in part because of that, it had some powerful opposition. Uh, particularly from the National Rifle Association, a membership organization that largely works as a nonprofit, and the Minnesota Citizens Concern for Life, the pro-life organization. Now, those two together um, obviously have a lot of influence with Republicans, but they also have a fair amount of influence with Democrats in the legislature. There's a lot of conservative Democrats who are holding on to their seats who said, we will not pass this bill because uh, these groups oppose it, because you're not doing what you intend to do. Um, in any case, so I di certainly did some coverage on that. Other people did some coverage, and there was a lot of misunderstanding about what the bill would do, who was opposed to it. It's not that shadowy groups are tr necessarily trying to evade disclosure. They're not shadowy groups. They're absolutely obeying the current law. Um, and there were some problems with these bills. So that's one of the things that you know we certainly covered, but people don't read stuff like that, and I don't see a lot of laughter in the room right now, so this is my plea. Read those stories, you'll find out more. It'll be better for democracy, please. Thanks. Bill, after that. Um, one of the least paid attention to stories was one of the most obvious stories, and that was the bonding bill. Uh, we passed a massive bonding bill, plus the cash. So I think it's a total of about $1.2 billion of new construction money. This is the most massive bonding bill that I can remember. I think it probably is a, probably the largest. Chairman Carlson would probably know better. But, uh, and the reason it didn't get a lot of attention is, it's, as Matt Dean says, it's roads, it's water pipes, it's the electrical stuff. It's that boring stuff. It's buildings. But uh, it was a fascinating uh, work. You know, the um, most interesting piece in it, one that everybody agreed on, was the $126 million they needed to, to complete the renovation of the state capitol. Everybody wanted that done, but it was, you know, the Senate office building was, was always in background, it was a shadow. Uh, so that was a factor, but there's like a fourth of that money is going to higher education. They're pumping a lot of money into putting new roofs and windows on old buildings, but there's a lot of money in there for 
for uh, classrooms and for laboratories and that sort of thing. Um, the one little one bill that didn't get any or one issue that didn't get any attention at all, and Chairman Carlson's probably the only other person in the room who paid much attention to it, stuck in that omnibus uh, appropriation bill, not in the bonding bill, was funding from the state for something called the James Ford Bell Museum of Natural History. That thing has been around as long as I can remember. If any of you have been over at the university and, and seen it, it's uh, in pretty bad shape. It should be replaced. Uh, one time there were plans to put a planetarium in. We don't have a planetarium in Minnesota. Uh, so there have been a small group of strong advocates led by uh, Alice Hausman, the chair of the Capital Investment Committee, who championed this. And, and, they, and the university didn't have it on their list of things they wanted done. But this group finally persuaded uh, their colleagues and the university to get behind it. They came up with another deal. It's not in the bonding bill. It would be cash. The university will finance it with uh, annual appropriations from the legislature. But that's something that could be a, a big surprise. It, it could be a huge draw. Uh, you know, kids from all over the state will end up going there. I think that's one of the uh, things that went completely unnoticed this year that probably will be getting a lot of attention in the future. Good. And Mary, your thoughts. First, what I had trouble talking my bosses into covering, which is funny because it ended up being the story of the year, was medical marijuana. <laughs> and the reason is we're different in public television. Our viewers, our audience is smaller, but they're, they're very smart. They're very engaged. They're very educated. They read Bill, and they read Rachel, and they watch Tom, and then they come watch us. So we have to tell them something different. And my bosses kept saying, oh, it's overcovered. Everybody's doing it. Why do you want to do medical marijuana? And I kept saying, because I think it's going to happen. I just, you know, my gut was, I think it's going to happen and we need to cover it. If this really turns this issue this quickly in one session, I want to try and cover it. So we have to cover it differently. So I did angles of racial justice, mm -hmm. how the first lawmaker, and I think Minnesota history, actually came forward for full legalization of medical marijuana, a, a House member, and how... This, this was a little bit behind it, quietly. You know, the governor complained at one point that this is really all about full legalization of recreational marijuana. So we covered that angle. Finally, I did talk my bosses into it, and I think I ended up being able to do a few stories. But I don't have 93 newscasts, as Tom Hauser <laughs> does. I have two in a week, uh, Wednesday night almanac at the Capitol, Friday night almanac. So we have to be selective about our stories. And Purposely, we try to cover some undercovered issues. And it was funny that you mentioned the 5% campaign for caregivers because we challenged ourselves early on before a session. I thought, this is a really important story. You know, we have this tsunami of baby boomers aging, and we have a real crisis in funding in long term care. Why did you look at me when you said that? Sorry, Tom. I didn't know. <laughs> Of course not. <laughs> and I, the reason I decided to cover that was our audience um, is a little older, let's just say in public television. My brother who runs a large nursing home used to joke that, you know, your viewers are so old, Mary, some of them are dead and they're still watching and I found them dead with them, yeah. <laughs> but my brother also runs a large nursing home out on Lake Minnetonka and we were just chatting one day and he said to me, oh, this economy just sucks. I said, well, what do you mean? Isn't the economy getting better? Isn't that good for you? And he said, no, it's horrible for me because I can't find any workers. He said, when the economy gets better, nobody wants to come take care of the elderly. He said, you know, people can go make more at McDonald's than they can in my facility. I just kind of, that was jaw dropping to, to find out how low the pay was in long-term care and our you know, our greatest generation who we're supposed to be taking care of and the funding was so low. So what we did, because as Tom said, it's a tough story to tell. It sounds like mostly numbers when you're at the Capitol. So we spent three weeks going out dusk to dawn showing long-term care workers, working with the disabled, working with the elderly, showing their real work. And we put that on for three straight weeks. And when we get, you know, the Nielsen's back that show you the ratings, it was the highest rated thing we did. And that was shocking because, you know, that's hard to talk people into, a story like that. And the Twitter feed those days, people kept saying, gosh, this is hard to watch. We were not watching pretty footage. It was not great. It was not puppies and babies, which everyone loves on TV. But over and over, we heard the feedback. This was tough to watch, but we needed to see it. So that was work that, you know, we felt good about in our mission to be able to kind of cover the, the undercovered because these folks do a great job. 
Meanwhile, we had water skiing squirrels over on, <laughs> over on commercial television. <laughs> Very popular. A Twitter feed was filling up. Maybe we need some squirrels. <laughs> I want to talk just a minute, I, and I, I want to make it quick because we're running out of time and I want to get to the audience questions, but um, one of the things that I had heard over and over again was there seemed to be a lot of back office, non-transparent, kind of on the sidelines deals being cut, and is that, um, was it, was it this, was this year unusual in that way? Um, you know, the Senate office building from last session, the bonding bill did not see much of the light of day. That was kind of all settled before it got brought to the floor. Um, tell me a little bit about that, Rachel. You got a microphone. You're ready to talk. Let's start with you. Well, first of all, at the end of session, every session I have covered, there are times when we pretend we know what's going on in the media, but we don't know what's going on. There are always uh, rooms that are closed to us. Um, but most sessions, we literally sit outside of those rooms, sometimes for hours upon hours on end. You know, when Zellers was speaker, he would, at 2 o'clock in the morning, see a, a bedraggled group of us, you know, sort of getting up and saying, anything going on? And generally, he wouldn't really tell us what was going on. We would hear some weeks later that somebody broke down in tears. I don't think it was Kurt, but it may have been. So. You know, as much as there is supposed transparency at the Capitol, a lot of the times on big issues there really isn't. As Bill said, a lot of it goes on, you know, that we hear about much later. And frankly, one of the problems with covering this legislature is, guess who makes the rules on what is transparent? The legislature. Guess who's exempt? Communications are exempt from the Data Practices Act, which we use to get people's correspondence. The legislature. They decide um, how to make the rules to keep us out. And so there have been cases, you know, on the stadium, one of the things we heard is that essentially their rules say if you ha have a quorum in a room, then that mm -hmm. has to be open to the public. So what did they do? They would have, you know, their key eight negotiators, and they would make sure that a quorum wasn't available. So literally someone would come in and negotiate something and then say, okay, tap out, and the next person would go in to make sure they didn't have that magic number. And so was this year worse in some ways? Yes, because we didn't have those stakeouts where we're asking the, the stupid questions and we're getting the stupid answers because they are all Democrats. But it's not, it's not all that new. It's not all that different. And it is all that frustrating. Bill, anything to add to that? The, the deals have almost always been cut in private. You know, it's very hard to do that kind of negotiating and, in public, and I, I agree with Rachel. I, you know, ideally they should have open negotiations. Uh, Arne Carlson, they that, yes, they tried that. Well, they also tried that with uh, Arne Carlson briefly, and uh, it never works because uh, the negotiators come in and they play to the cameras. They play to us, uh, so they're they're making points. They aren't really negotiating or tossing out ideas. That, you know, if you want to get a deal done, you might have to toss out a crazy idea that you don't want people outside the room to hear about. So. As long as I've been there, it's always, you know, the real deals are cut in the back rooms. Now, Bill has been there longer than I have, but he's exactly right. Uh, they've, uh, it's always been backroom deals. The difference this year and last year is that it, because it's all Democrats controlling the process, you don't have one side selling the other side out. When you had Republican leaders from the House going into a meeting with Democratic leaders from the Senate, uh, oftentimes each side would tell you privately what went on in the meeting because they were anxious to get out the, their side of the story and tell you, uh, you know, how the other side is being stubborn and, and here's what they're doing. But when it's all Democrats, other than the governor occasionally throwing them under the bus, they would not uh, sell each other out. So there were not these bipartisan meetings going on. It was essentially Democrats negotiating with Democrats, and they just weren't willing to sell each other out to us. So these backroom deals were even harder to discern what was going on. They've tried openness. We've all witnessed experiments in openness, which we've demanded, which we want, because we do hate these backroom deals. Reporters can't stand it. We're all about giving you information and openness, and it frustrates us to no end. Plus, it's not really fun to sleep on marble floors. 
at all, so it's uncomfortable. And who's paying attention at 2 in the morning? And people make mistakes in the middle of the night. It's maybe not the best time to be legislating. We've seen experiments. Speaker Swiggum opened up the caucus. Remember the open caucus? And we'd show up, and they didn't do anything. They wouldn't fight until we went away, of course. So the open media caucus, that ended. And then, as you mentioned, Tim Pawlenty tried negotiations in the governor's reception room. Open, cameras there. They didn't cut any deals with the camera there. That's just the reality of the place, for better or worse. I remember once when they were trying to cut, I think it was a bonding bill, out in the open, and Senator Sandy Pappas just kind of threw down her hands, got frustrated, and she said, would you just go in the back room and cut the deal already? <laughs> And I thought it was one of the most honest moments because it was, it was just painful trying to watch this happen out in the open. And we know it doesn't happen in the open. The deals are always cut behind closed doors. Good. Thank you. All right, I got one last question and then we're going to go to the audience. So get your questions ready. Um, I am wondering, we're going to have you look into your crystal ball and tell us a little bit about the upcoming election. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think the Governor Dayton will be reelected? Do you think the House will flip? Tell us what you think and we're going to start, Mr. Hauser, with you. Well, oddly enough, just the last couple of nights, we've done a significant amount of uh, polling. So we have uh, at least a snapshot of where things stand right now. And, and to be honest, they're pretty much about where I thought they would be. Uh, both Senator Franken and Governor Dayton have uh, single-digit leads which uh, you know, against hypothetical um, GOP opponents, which doesn't really surprise me. All of our polling, especially about Senator Franken, uh, really going on for years now, there is a solid, hardcore... Uh, 39 to 40 percent of Minnesotans uh, who just will not vote for the man. And so his approval rating has always been somewhere in the mid to upper 40s, which of course makes him vulnerable, but at the same time still makes him the favorite, because as you know in Minnesota you generally don't need 50 percent of the vote to win re-election because of the Independence Party. And so, you know, right now in a matchup with uh, Mike McFadden, he is up by six points, 46 to 40 percent. And this was a, a significant number of Minnesotans, likely voters who were polled. The margin of error on the poll was just three percent. But the, the real problem for Franken is that even against Jim Abler, who is uh, underfunded, undermanned, and really a, a, a big long shot, even he is only nine points behind Al Franken because there's this 39 to 40 percent that just will not vote for him. In stark contrast to Amy Klobuchar, who I, it, it, one of these days, I think her polling approval rating is going to be 100 percent. I just, I've never seen anything uh, like it. But uh, so th that's the situation in the in the Senate race, and then in the governor's race, uh, very similar. Governor Dayton, in every one of our hypothetical matchups, is at 46 or 47 percent, whether it's against uh, Zellers or uh, Seifert or Johnson or Honor, he's 46 or 47 percent, which again. Uh, makes him vulnerable. Uh, another uh, polling number we're going to do some reporting on. Today we did a generic uh, House uh, ballot. Uh, generically, who would you vote for, a, a Republican or uh, a Democrat and, uh, or someone else? And there's a few Independence Party candidates. Uh, the polling came out, I, I believe if I got the numbers uh, correct, 45% say Republican, 42% say Democrat, and then the other is undecided or other. So again, about a dead heat, about a 3% margin of error in that poll. So these races are going to be very close in the Minnesota House. I think the governor's race and in the Senate race, I think in the Senate and governor's races, I believe that the incumbents are still the favorites, but uh, nobody's going to win any of those races by more than two or three points. And I think the, the majority in the House is totally up for grabs. Mary. I think the House in Minnesota is always competitive, which is why it's such a fun body to cover. And we'll be focusing this fall on probably the half a dozen seats that are going to be the most competitive. The control of the House will be decided by half a dozen to it to a dozen seats, and we're going to start traveling around the state to those swing seats. And that's, that's where it's going to be met. And it, voters are going to have to think about some of the incumbents who voted either for or against their district on issues like gay marriage. I think we'll start to hear that. And that's been very quiet. That issue has pretty much gone away, but I suspect it will come up a little bit in some of these competitive House seats. So House, always something to watch. And invariably, our statewide races tighten up. I think we've already seen that. That's a trajectory. When I look at polls, I always tell people don't just pay attention to the number and the snapshot, but what direction it's going. And I think the polls are consistently showing the race will tighten for U.S. Senate and for governor. 
And in Minnesota, reporters are always ready for the last minute thing to happen. I don't know what it is about Minnesota politics, but there's going to be a swimming pool or something, a horrible accident. We, we just have these remarkable things that happen at the last minute. It's why we never take vacation, right, anywhere near the election because of the, the last minute surprises. And then you can't take vacation afterwards when you have an eight-month-long recount that you have to cover. Let's just, let's just hope. Well, there's a debate whether it's eight or nine months, right? There Senator Franken got into it he with you a little bit. Me, yeah. but Norm Coleman just recently said nine months, and I'm going with Norm Coleman on that one. <laughs> well, I can say as a person who has carried something for nine months, it was about as painful. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll, we'll go with nine months <laughs> recount. <laughs> but let, yeah, let's just hope we're not headed for okay. another recount. All right. Rachel. Um, so I'm not going to make predictions. A couple reasons. One is if I'm wrong, you'll remind me of it, and I don't want to be in that position. Two is we all saw what happened in Virginia's 7th Congressional District on Tuesday. Nobody knows what voters are going to do. So I'm not going to go out on that limb, but I will tell you a couple things to, re to consider. One is we've got Dayton and Franken on the ballot. I call them the recount twins. Remember, both of them had statewide recounts when they won their first elections. That automatically makes them vulnerable. Two is right now, President Obama in this rather democratic state on presidential politics is not all that popular. That may have a big impact. Um, three is the Independence Party, which Tom mentioned, does not have uh, marquee candidates in these statewide races the way they have before. You know, people had heard of Tom Horner, and there was a big contrast between Horner and Dayton and Emmer last time around. Um, people had heard of Tim Penny. People certainly heard of Jesse Ventura. So they just don't have someone that, frankly, even us political geeks have heard of before. And so, yeah, there may be some protest votes, but we're not necessarily talking the 16% that Dean Barkley got in the U.S. Senate race. The last thing I'd ask you to consider is if you look at the Minnesota House, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but since 2004 it has started as, Demo started as Republican, then went to Democrat, then went to Republican, and now it's Democrat again. You got to watch the Minnesota House. This is an off-year election, which means it's not presidential. Democrats won't have the extra. Depends how you count, but maybe it's three or four points that they tend to get in presidential years. So they they had that when they won the House back. They won't have this, that this time. Um, and that that turnout question, which we'll be covering more in the Star Tribune, will definitely affect those statewide races. If you look at the districts where turnout it tends to be low in midterms it tends to be Democratic districts. And so that really will affect Dayton, it will affect Franken, um, and in some of these swing areas, and I see some of the lawmakers here who are hoping to come back to the Capitol who may be in some swing areas, you know, there's a lot of flopping going on there. And so there's gonna be a hand-to-hand a -hand combat to keep the House Democratic. It's not gonna get as much attention as the premier races, but I think it's gonna be really crucial to figuring out the future of Minnesota. And Bill. Well, the one prediction I can make with absolute confidence is that any prediction I make will be wrong. <laughs> I've learned that many times over. Um, Rachel touched on one point that is very true, and that's it's been a factor in Minnesota as long as I can remember. If any of you remember Charlie Baxter, a, a political science professor at the university, for, the first one I heard talk about the W factor. In presidential elections, the Democratic turnout is up. Non-presidential elections, it's down. And Democrats, in my experience, have never really found a way to overcome that. Their uh, turnout will fall off this year. Uh, they're very much aware of that. Uh, it's all that Ken Martin talks about. We've got to get our turnout. But I, I don't know how they turn that around. Um, before that happens, though, the, I think the most unpredictable thing uh, depends in part on two guys that I'm sitting here looking at. Marty Seifert over here and Kurt Zellers. The, uh, gubernatorial primary on, on August 12th for the Republicans seems to me, and you might disagree, a, a wide open race. Anybody can win. I can make an argument for any of the four of them winning. So I think that's going to be the most fascinating thing to watch for the next two months. And I have no idea how that's going to turn out. Marty and Kurt, you can try to persuade me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. All right. Now we've got a couple of minutes left. Let's see who's got some questions from the audience. Greg Korstad. Stand up, yell loud.
I'll, I'll jump on that. And it's funny you mentioned Tom Rukavina because it's a ranger. Those rangers are the, the classic lawmakers to watch. And it's the issue we've been talking about a lot, medical marijuana. Representative Carly Moline from up on the range, I think, was the emerging lawmaker. At one point I said, I think she's been on my air every single week of session. I have to find something else to cover that she's not involved with. Because medical marijuana was the surprise story of session. And then also here you had a woman eight, nine months pregnant, long, long hours on the floor, and also packing, passing the Women's Economic Security Act. So she was kind of a surprise rising star from this session. The other lawmaker I feel like I covered constantly, and he probably should be here, is Representative Ryan Winkler. And that was because of minimum wage. He was the House author on minimum wage. And then another story that got a lot of media attention were those get out of jail free cards, you know, the DWI immunity. And he was the bill author on that one too. So those two got a lot of face time in TV. Any other thoughts? I'll say three. Um, one is Senator Brandon Peterson, a Republican. Um, a conservative, libertarian Republican. He was very angry about the medical marijuana deal that was cut. He also voted for gay marriage um, last year, and he was the only Republican in the Senate to do so. Um, and the other thing that I find fascinating about him is that he has picked up a, a cue from a um, member of Congress and now writes on social media about every single vote he takes on the Senate floor and explains why he voted the way he voted. It's a really interesting exercise in transparency, and frankly, the state Senate votes far more frequently than the U.S. House, the one that he's modeling after. Um, the second one I would say is uh, Senator Scott Dibble. If you look at what Senator Dibble has done in the last couple years, he was the sponsor of the gay marriage bill last year. Now, five years ago, no one would have thought that would have passed, right? He was also the sponsor of the bullying bill, and you'll recall that's something that has failed at the legislature for several years in a row before it passed and he was the sponsor of medical marijuana. I think he's a guy to keep an eye on. He's in a Minneapolis district, he's very safe, and there might be higher offices in his future. The last per person I'll name, and it's not because she's in the room, but Representative Loon, I've gotta say, you, you fascinate me. Um, <laughs> I have tweeted that I would like to cover Representative Loon running for governor against Representative Aaron Murphy. First of all, it would perhaps finally give us a female governor. Why not, Minnesota? Come on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but both Murphy and Representative Loon um, fight in ways that are not mean. They fight on policy. They've had uh, some colloquies on the, the House floor that have just been fascinating, and I've tried to live tweet them, and no one really cares because they're only fascinating to me. But I think they, the two of them could have a really interesting fight about the philosophy of Minnesota, the future of Minnesota. So, you know, I'm not going to say who I would vote for in that race, but I wouldn't mind covering it. Tom? Uh, Bill? I would just echo what uh, Mary said. I, actually, I, I agree with both Scott Dibble, who seemed to have, uh, you know, his finger on every key piece of legislation. And Carly Moline, what really impressed me about her was that when that whole medical marijuana issue started going south, uh, and the governor was one of the reasons for that, uh, she kind of took him on on this issue and was not afraid, especially for someone as young as she is and as early in her career to be taking on a sitting uh, governor. Uh, the one thing working in her favor is that uh, Governor Dayton does not uh, appear to be the vindictive type to me. If somebody goes against him, I, I, he doesn't strike me as someone. Uh, he's apparently uh, wronged Rachel here at some point. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he doesn't strike he me. He does not forget. He, he, well, he, he probably doesn't, but I, don't, but I don't think he would punish her for that because I think he realized that was a mess of his own making. And uh, she was very passionate on that issue. But the interesting thing is what we're talking about is that most of uh, whom we've mentioned uh, are Democrats. And a lot of the reason for that is that Republicans, again, have no power at the legislature right now. They, can't, uh, they can introduce anything they want, and they're likely not going to get a hearing on it, let alone have any of us up here talking about how they're a rising star, because frankly, uh, they're, they're able to do very little right now being in the minority. Um, let me say I, I agree with most of what they said. I'd, I'd add uh, at least one Republican name, and that's uh, Minority Leader Kurt Dowd in the House. Uh, he's been in the House now for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, something like that. He's, he's a young guy. 
uh, and he did a marvelous job, I think, as leader of that caucus, holding them together, which, as Kurt knows, is, is like hurting cats. Uh, but not only did he hold them together, but he set a very civil tone. He and Speaker Thiessen had a very civil relationship. They, they worked together. They fought like cats and dogs on policy issues, but they had a very civil relationship. I think he had the same kind of relationship with uh, Senator Bach and with the governor. So I, I think that he's a, someone you should keep your eye on as a possible rising star. And then I want to mention somebody that I had a year ago pegged as a rising star who got doused. And that was uh, David Fitzsimmons, a representative from up in the, uh, uh, where's that? Uh, Albertville. Yeah, Wright County, I think. Yeah. Wright County area. Uh, guy who came in was, just struck me as one of the brightest strategic thinkers to enter the legislature. Uh, then last year he made the mistake, the political mistake, of coming up with an amendment to the gay, right, gay marriage bill that, uh, and, and voting for it. Uh, he could not get endorsed by his home, you know, his district Republicans, and so he retired after one term. I suspect that uh, it may be a temporary retirement. I think he's such a bright guy that he will be back in some way, shape, or form in the future. But uh, it strike, strikes me as he was one rising star who really got doused this time. Good. Will, very quickly. Uh, there was a lot of peanut butter. You may notice that about every corner of the state got money for a new convention center. Uh, a lot of these things had been tied up for a long time. St. Cloud, uh, I went and did a story on that last week, and uh, Mayor Kleiss was saying they've been trying to get their money for their convention center for 15 years. Jesse Ventura even pig stamped it at one point. Uh, they've been trying forever to get that. That finally broke through. Mankato got money. Rochester got, I think, $35 million. They got the whole enchilada on that deal. So there was a lot of that. There was some boring stuff, as I think Bill mentioned earlier, but there was also a lot of bonding bill eye candy, <laughs> you know, a lot of buildings that are going to be going up that are going to be these shiny new objects. Uh, and remember, this follows on the heels by about four or five years of Duluth getting money for the, for the deck and their new arena. So now, uh, if you want to have a convention in Minnesota, uh, we're open for business. I guess I'll take unsession because in public TV we were geeky enough to spend a whole half an hour on unsession because the governor had teed it up in his state of the state address and then he came up with a thousand provisions and in the end more than a thousand. I think it ended up being about 1,200 provisions passed. It, it wasn't sexy. It wasn't exciting. But the biggest disappointment is the one thing they could not repeal was this requirement that the egg commissioner has to hunt down wild boars, I believe, personally. Apparently that was necessary to stay in law, so that, that's still in law. That was not repealed. Go ahead. Do you want to talk bonding? Okay. Uh, I hadn't heard it called peanut butter before. <laughs> it's pork. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, there's, there are some questionable projects in there, but not a lot. Uh, I think the most interesting case, though, was uh, the Lewis and Clark water project. And Republicans had the ability to block a bonding bill. And that was one project that they insisted on. If you aren't familiar with it, that's water from the Missouri River. It's coming through the Dakotas. And it stopped, uh, the federal government stopped funding the project at some point. So it stops at about the Iowa or South Dakota border. And Laverne and Worthington are running out of water. And uh, that was uh, a project that the Republicans insisted on. And as soon as that got stuck in the bill, it seemed like, all the votes came loose. So I think that was kind of the linchpin for getting that whole big uh, bill passed. Rachel, I'm going to give you the last word of the day. Oh, my goodness. Uh, first on unsession, you know, look, will most Minnesotans feel the results of unsession? Probably not. On the other hand, if you're a big government Democrat like Dayton is, and you can say, hey, guys, I just repealed more than 1,000 laws to make government more efficient, that's not a bad campaign slogan. You can also say these unsession provisions were, by and large, incredibly bipartisan. You know, if you're a Democrat or Republican and your voters, like all voters, are sick of the partisanship at the Capitol, guess what? You both have a little feather in your cap. In terms of the bonding bill, think of some of the places we've named. Uh, St. Cloud, Mankato, uh, Rochester. A lot of these places, what they have in common is they're kind of swing areas. And so in an election year for Dayton and for the House members, you know, if you are 
a lawmaker from Rochester, you can say, I got you your thing, whatever your thing is. If you're in southern Minnesota, you can say, I got you water, which is kind of important. Um, so certainly Republicans pushed some of these projects, but it also looks good for Dayton. And then, you know, in the Twin Cities, the bonding doesn't have quite the same impact. You know, there's lots of money spent in the Twin Cities on bonding, but people don't feel it in quite the same way. Um, so I think there's absolutely every single year there's electioneering politics that goes on in the bonding bill, and this year was no different. I know she was going to get the last word, but I just have to mention just because <laughs> yes, it's because no, of course not. Um, the uh, just this morning, uh, Governor Dayton is going to be in Rochester uh, helping to uh, celebrate the fact that they got the Mayo Civic Center money, and then he's traveling over to Albert Lee to, I don't know, cut a ribbon on some water cleanup thing at Fountain Lake of all places. These are not things that you could argue would ordinarily be getting a, a gubernatorial visit, but election day is four or five months away. And so when we're covering these things, we have to be looking very carefully at where they're going and why they're going there because now everything any of these politicians do who are incumbents is going to be uh, tinged with the idea that there's an election coming up in just a few months. Yes. And on that, we're going to conclude. So thank you very much for... Uh... All right. I promised. Representative Zellers, very, very quickly, what was the best or the worst thing that happened in the last session? Thank you. All right, and join me in a warm thank you for our panelists this morning. And do read these people, watch them on TV, follow them on Twitter. They're fascinating. They, they gave me much, much, much of the information that I got during the session, so I appreciate that very much on a very personal note. All right, and I've got a couple of announcements that I'm going to cut you loose this morning, so thank you for... Um, Talk nice about me to the president the next time you see him and let him know that we kept the wheels on the bus this morning. All right. Thank you very much to our panelists again. Thank you very much to our sponsors. Um, the Political Action Committee is going to be co-hosting with the Minnesota Chamber PAC, the PACNIC event. So if you'd like to learn more about that, see me. Um, the Twin West Leadership Council is headed down to the ballpark. We're going to be at Target Field and we'll watch the Twins take on the White Sox uh, next week. So see Travis if you have some um, time and would like to join us for that. And we're going to be hosting some policy sessions this summer. So watch your email for the details and the information regarding that. Um, we want to have a really good conversation around uh, what does good policy for Minnesota look like. So we're going to be hosting a couple of those sessions this summer. So do keep your eyes open for that. Again, thank you to our sponsor. This is the last of our 2013-2014 Legislative Breakfast Series. So we go on hiatus for the months of July and August, and then we'll be back with you again in September. So thank you very much to all of you for participating.